Hi everyone, this is Ali. I'm one of the founders of Digital Doctors. And for those of you who haven't signed in before, um, I'm normally an intensive care doctor in the Greater Western Hospital in Swindon. And um, the reason why we've set up this project is to help medical students out who are missing out on teaching, uh, if they're missing out on teaching around the world. And a lot of junior doctors have um, joined the front line early to help with the COVID struggle. And as a result, we want to give them refresher courses in various aspects of medicine. So I hope you enjoyed the lecture. Today's lecture is about chest x-ray interpretation. The learning outcomes from today that I want you to take away are mainly in assessing the quality of a chest x-ray, the approach in its interpretation. And then after, I'm going to give you a few examples of a few COVID patients. And then at the end, we'll talk about how to confirm whether an NG tube is in place based on an x-ray. Just be advised that this, this talk does not certify you in being able to independently confirm whether an NG tube is in place. Different hospitals require you to go to their own training sessions and different hospitals don't even allow certain junior doctors to do so. It has to be done by a more senior doctor, even a radiologist in one place. But we're gonna teach you just out of good measure and it's a useful skill to have anyway. So the uses for an x-ray, as you know, are making diagnosis or helping you with the diagnosis based on radiological evidence and also looking to see whether a line or a medical instrument has been inserted correctly, such as an NG tube or a central line or an endotracheal tube. So before you interpret any x-ray, it's important to go through a few housekeeping things. You look at the details of the patient. Make sure that you, are the, you have the right patient's x-ray in front of you. You look at the hospital number, the date of birth, and the name. It is obviously a catastrophe to make a decision about a patient based on somebody else's x-ray. And if it's 3 a.m. in the morning, you're in A&E or an acute medicine um, unit, and you're really tired, or you're on the wards and you're exhausted, it's, it's not uncommon to click on the wrong patient. So just make sure you ground yourself and you make sure you've got the right person in front of you. Now you look, also look at the date and the time. Many reasons why these are important. One reason, if you're making a comparison of a new x-ray to an old x-ray, you know that when the x-ray was taken. Obviously, if an x-ray was taken 10 years ago, um, it might be of less important compared to whether an x-ray was about two days ago, for example. Say if you notice that someone has a pleurofusion on a new x-ray, and I'll tell you what a pleurofusion is, and then on a new uh, older actually, you notice that it was there two days ago that make you think about a bit differently about a patient. You look at how the x-ray is orientated after that, which we'll go into. And then the juicy part is that you look at the quality of the x-ray. This is very important in the work, but also for your examinations to do properly. So a bit of orientation. There's three ways an x-ray can be taken. PA, which stands for posterior anterior, AP, which stands for anterior posterior, or looking at the chest from a lateral perspective. We're only going to talk about the first two. So, what does PA and AP mean? This diagram is an example for anterior posterior x ray. The radiological beams are going from the patient's front, i.e., anterior, to the back, posterior, then being collected by a board which collects the frequencies and then makes an image here, okay? PA is the other way around, where the beams are going from the patient's back to the front, and the board is here. And there are reasons why it's important no, no, noticing the difference. In PA, you essentially need to be fit, being able to stand up or sit up and take a good breath in and have the x-ray taken. APs are essentially done for people who are too frail or sick to get out of bed, and the x-ray has been taken in their bed. So you automatically know based on whether a patient has an AP x-ray or not, how well the patient are. Is if they have an AP x-ray, it makes you think that they might be too unwell to get up out of bed. And it's worth commenting on always. So we tend to prefer PA x-rays if possible. The reason why the way PA x-rays are taken is that the hands are essentially held behind the head and that gets the scapula out of the way. And it prevents the scapula mixing in with the rest of the lungs and giving you any difficulties in interpretation. Often the edge of the scapula, which I'll show you later on, can be confused for the lung, lung margin, and that can make a pneumothorax difficult to diagnose. And I'll show you what I mean later when we go through a few examples. 
Also, if you're doing an AP X-ray, which is from the front to the back, the beams hit the thyroid first and then go through the rest of the body, which can give it unnecessary radiation and make the patient at risk of getting a cancer. It's obviously a lower risk, but you know it does it does build up. But from the back, it goes through the body and then it hits the thyroid after that. Also, in PA X-rays, the heart isn't amplified. To give you an idea as to why, imagine if you get a torch and put it in a dark room, turn it on and then put your finger in front of the torch, your shadow of your finger will be quite big. If you put your finger further away, the shorter the, the smaller the shadow gets. Similarly to here, so this is an AP X-ray, the heart is obviously closer to the torch. In this, in this case, the torch is obviously a radioactive substance and therefore a project bigger. But if you're going the other way, it's further away, like your finger goes further away and the heart will get smaller. You cannot comment on whether an X-ray um, has cardiomegaly in it on an AP film. It has to be done in a PA. And of course, if you do an, a an AP film, the breast tissue can get in the way and obstruct um, the beams, making it difficult to interpret. And generally, in PA X-rays, because the patient is able to stand up, with their hands behind their head, you're more likely to get a full view um, of the X-ray. Often in um, anterior posture reviews, you'll have to get two separate x-rays to look at their bases and then their apex, because it's hard to catch the whole thing. Next part of the quality check is looking at the inspiration effort. Essentially, you count the ribs. You can either count the anterior ones or the posterior ones. I've given you a diagram to essentially be able to see why which ones which. The anterior ones are going from angling down from the humerus to the center. So this is one here, look, it's angling down from the humerus towards the heart. Here as well, angling down from the humerus towards the heart. Posterior films and x-rays, ribs rather, sorry, are the other way around. They angle up from the diaphragm to the heart. And if you look at this diagram here, okay, these are the anterior ribs. They're going down from towards the humerus to the heart. And the posterior ones here, going up from diaphragm to the sternum, okay? For anterior ribs, they should be five to six. If there's anything less than that, you worry about whether they're taking a good breath in. And for posterior, it's eight to 10. Now, the reason why you worry about this is that if they haven't taken a good breath in, that makes you worry that they're too sick to take a deep breath in or they're too frail to take a deep breath in essentially. So it's always worth coming to one. Now, if you have too many ribs, i.e. above six anterior or above 10 posterior, that's also an issue called hyperexpansion. And we'll go into that very shortly. And you count the ribs by using the mid-clavicular line. So the middle of the clavicle, and you count down. And that's your reference point for counting. So penetration essentially looks into how much radiation is going in and whether it's enough or too much. So the way you do this is by looking up the vertebra, you should be able to just about see it. If you can't see the vertebra, like in this case, it's underpenetrated. And if you can see it too clearly, it's overpenetrated. And that can affect the quality of the image of any structures or other maladies that might be in the lung field. And rotation essentially is how twisted the patient, but this you look at the clavicle heads, and it should be the same distance in the spinous process. This patient, if you look, this is way deviated out on the patient's right side. And as a result, the heart has been pushed over to the right to the right lung. And that's because the patient's really rotated. If this was a pneumothorax in this case, you might worry that it's been pushed over to the side and it's a tension. That's not the case. So the patient's quite rotated. And this can also make things like airway deviation um, look like it's present, but it's not actually there. But this is a normal case on this side. And angulation is essentially what angle the radiological beams hit the patient. I don't know what angle um, radiographers aim for normally, I'll be honest. Um, but I know if it's too much, it can, interp it can affect the way the image is uh, um, laid out. And this image, for example, if it's too high up and it's aiming down, you're looking down into the lungs, like in this patient. It's been taken too high. So as a result, the chin's got in the way of the apex of the lung, which is the top part. And the clavicles are covering the middle part of the lung. And it's making the lungs, lungs look a lot smaller than they actually are. 
and you can see the ribs are very close together. That's because it's angled down. And exposure essentially means, can you see the whole lung fields, each margin and the costophrenic angles, which are this part here. Well, apologies, it seemed to have skipped forward. So exposure, as we mentioned, can you see both angles very clearly? And can you see the whole lung? And you also comment on things like, is there any unnecessary artifact on the way? An artifact is essentially things that are there that shouldn't be there. Like, is the patient's hand in the way? Is a blanket in the way? Are there pads in the way? Or um, anything obscuring your airway? Is the patient's chin in the way? So that's always worth commenting on as well. So regarding the actual approach to interpretation, like with anything in medicine, and in life for that matter as well, be it an x-ray, CT scan, um, assessing a sick patient on the ward, you have to go through a systematic way to make sure you cover your basis. I use an A to E approach or an A to I approach in um, this particular situation. You don't necessarily have to go in this order. It's just the way that I've remembered since medical school, a way to cover everything without forgetting. So I do A to I, which is airway, bones, cardia, which is the heart, diaphragm and fusions, fields, which is the lung fields, and also foreign bodies, gastro, the high limb, and at the end, I offer an impression. Now, when you're interpreting an x-ray, I wanna start with this, and I want you guys to take this away from this lecture. If there's one thing you take away, it's this. Never jump to a diagnosis. Always say what you see and describe what you see, describe what it's associated with, and then you offer a differential or a diagnosis. That's the same for an examination of the heart, for example. If you listen to a murmur, my advice is that you don't jump in and just say that this patient has an ejection systolic murmur due to aortic stenosis. No, you say this patient has a murmur. I think it's a systolic murmur. It's louder um, when the patient breathes in or breathes out. It's associated with a slow rising pulse. My differentials could be a aortic stenosis, a, um, a regurg, so on and so forth. That's how you do it for everything. Say what you see or hear, then offer a reason why, okay? Especially when you're junior, there's no point acting too smart, okay? And people rather be told what you're seeing than what you think it is straight away. They're interested in what you think, but say what you see, that can help the other person you're speaking to if you're reporting the x-ray to them, make a decision as well. And that's what you'll see radiologists do. They'll describe what they're seeing, and at the end, a little paragraph, patient has a pneumonia, patient has a pneumothorax. So let's go through each individual section and we can tell you what particular pathologies you need to look out for and how you describe them, okay? So A is airway. Very simply, you look for the trachea, which is this black tube-like structure. Remember, in an x-ray, black is gas. White is anything that's denser. So white can be bone, can be the diaphragm, it's the clavicle, can be a pneumonia, can be a collapse of the lung, essentially. The black is gas, okay? That includes the trachea as well. The trachea is a pipe-like structure. Always follow it down and watch it bifurcate. It should be central in between the clavicles as well. Things that can push it and pull it are things like big pulmonary fusions, tumor thorax, a cancer, a previous operation. And it can be appear to be deviated because of a rotated patient as well. If they rotated one side or the other, the patient could go, the tracker could go to one side as well. Okay, so if you do see a deviation, it's always worth commenting on whether it's deviated, okay? That's the airway. And also comment on anything, anything that you see in the airway, like a foreign body, for example, like this patient. You see, there's loads of lines here. There's a central line and an NG tube, but there's a thin line here. And that's the endotracheal tube, the breathing tube that someone needs for a ventilator, essentially. Okay, you can also use it to determine whether it's in the right place. You don't want it going down the right main bronchus, okay, because otherwise one line won't get ventilated, but that's not on the scope of this talk. So bones, 
and with bones, I put soft tissues as well. Main thing you do is you count the bones, okay? See if there's enough or too many. Remember, if there's more than six anterior bones and more than eight posterior bones, that's a sign that the patient has hyperexpansion because of too much interthoracic pressure or gas trapping. Often you see that in patients with emphysema or COPD, okay? In this particular patient, you can see that he has quite a lot of ribs, okay? I'll let you count down the anterior ribs in your own time. And he's also got a bit of flattening of the diaphragm as well because of all that pressure from the lungs squashing it down, okay? So if you hadn't done your counting in your initial quality check, you can do it now, okay? Other thing you can do is look at each individual rib and see if you can see any fractures. Now, the caveat here is that you shouldn't be doing an x-ray just to look for a rib fracture. You do an x-ray to look for the complications of a rib fracture, okay? If you're worried about whether someone has a flail chest or whether someone's unwell with it, provided you don't think they're having intentional methodologies with it, you can get a CT um, scan, um, okay? So if you do a request to them on an x-ray and you write four chest pain rib fractures, often the radiographers won't do it because it's a clinical diagnosis. You look for the complications, such as non-tensioning pneumothorax or hemothorax. The reason why I say non-tensioning is because you should never get an x-ray for a tensioning pneumothorax. It's a clinical diagnosis. If you suspect it, you have to do decompression by putting a needle in, uh, in, in, into the pleural space to decompress the lungs. That's out of the scope of this talk, okay? Other things you look for in soft tissue are things like breast tissue. So if it's a lady, you'll be able to see the breast down here. And the reason why that's important is A, if they have one breast, that might mean they've had a mastectomy on the other side because of the cancer. That can be relevant to the lungs in case they have lung mats, okay? And B, they can also obviously, if they're um, quite dense, obstruct part of the lower lungs as well so you might be able to there can be difficulty in seeing them another thing you can look out for especially in the context of trauma is surgical emphysema which is gas seeping out of the lung into the soft tissues and it gives you this appearance essentially so this patient has had a trauma i believe and he's got a pneumothorax which you can see here actually this is the lung lighting here we're going to give you more examples of pneumothoraces shortly Gas is seeping out, out of his lung, under his skin, and into his muscle fibers. So you can see the muscle fibers of his pecs quite well here, of his trapezius quite well here, and his deltoid. If you were to palpate this patient's chest, you'd feel like bubble wrap. It's quite interesting, actually. Um, and if you ever do feel that, that's a sign that someone's had some trauma um, to their chest. Okay? And you can see here that it's actually making it a bit difficult to tell whether there's a pneumothorax underneath. So it's obstructing the view a little bit, okay? So this is an example of a patient that's had a rib fracture. You can actually see it here, actually, with a pneumothorax with no surgical emphysema. But this is the lung marking here. And this is the rib fracture there, okay? It's very subtle. Don't worry, we'll talk about how to tell whether pneumothorax is present very shortly. Next is cardiac. So you look at the heart, you do what you call is follow this cardiac silhouette. So it's the outline of the heart. You should be able to see quite clearly. This is the hilum, okay? This is the aortic knuckle, this is the aortic arch, left ventricle, and the atrium on this side, okay? Two thirds should be on the right, one third should be on the left, okay? On a PA X-ray, you shouldn't be able to see that the heart is taking up 50% of the whole thorax. On an AP x-ray, because of the projection issues, as I told you, you shouldn't be interpreting it, okay? And the way you can interpret it on a P x-ray is draw a line through the edge of one thorax to the edge of the other, a line in between, and draw a line from one edge of the heart to the other, a line in between, and the distance and the ratio, obviously, should be less than 50%. If it's 50% of more, you worry about cardiomegaly. The definitive way to look out for that is obviously things like echoes, cardiac CTs, cardiac MRIs, okay? But in clinical context, it's worth considering. So I'm not sure if you heard me, unfortunately, and because an ambulance drove past um, my flat and it was quite loud, but in case you didn't, I'm sorry to repeat myself. 
the heart shouldn't take up more than 50% of the thorax. And essentially you measure one side of the heart to the other, okay? And then one side of the thorax to the other, and then you measure the ratio, it shouldn't be more than 50%. This arrow is just deviated a little bit from here, but you can see the heart is projecting here. So that's the edge there, not the edge there, okay? The outermost point to the outermost point, and same for the lungs here, okay? And you look for the silhouette to look for any obstructions. You should be able to see it clearly. If you often you might hear a phrase called the right border of the heart is not clear. That often can be because of pneumonia or a collapse of the lung down. Another thing that I look out for, but it's not taught in a lot of books, is the angle between the cardiac silhouette and the diaphragm. You should be able to see it relatively clearly. If it's absent, it can be because of an infection. It's not overly sensitive, but it's worth commenting on, in my opinion. Next is the diaphragm. So in this picture, you can see the angle actually there. In the diaphragm, look for a few things. Look for whether it's raised, particularly. Remember, the right is often a bit more raised compared to the left because of the liver. You look for whether it's flattened. So this patient, if you count the ribs, they're hyperexpanded and the diaphragms are squashed down and as a sign of intrathoracic pressure, okay? And one other thing you look for is pneumoperitoneum. If you can see a thin line of white very clearly with gas above and gas below, that can be a sign that the bowel is perforated and gas is collecting underneath. It can be on the left side and um, confused with the gastric bubble. But we'll go into that very shortly, okay? And with the diaphragm, you look for effusions, which we'll talk about very soon. So in this patient, um, going the diaphragm, the right one is particularly raised. This can be a sign of, of obviously a mass underneath or a phrenic nerve injury. Um, phrenic nerve is the nerve that controls the, um, the diaphragms. It's from roots C3, 4, and 5 of the cervical spine. And in this x-ray here on the right, you can see pneumoperitoneum. You can see that the diaphragm is very, very definely laid out a gas on both sides on this side as well again on the left side because of the stomach that can be just the gastric bubble so be careful and if any any concerns get your senior to have a look okay because it's it's a sign of something severe going on in the stomach so with the diaphragm comes effusions the costophrenic angle as you can see here is quite sharp isn't it if you have if you have blood there or pus there or fluid it blunts, you get this U-shaped, okay? Again, you look at this and you don't say, this patient has blood effusion. You say, this patient has blunting of the costophrenic angle. And you comment on anything it's associated with, okay? You can offer a differential after. It could be a little collapse of the lung. It could be a consolidation, which I will tell you what that is very shortly. Or it could be some fluid. Now. You might look at this x-ray and think that this patient has a large pleural effusion. But essentially what's happened is that this patient actually has a relatively small one. They've essentially lied down and it's tracked back because of gravity. So here it's pulled and here it's tracked back. So it makes it look large. So the way that I would interpret this is by saying that on the left side, on the left lung, there is widespread opacification, solid in nature, covering the whole hemithorax. My differentials are pleural refusion. I would like to check what position that the patient was in when it was taken, okay? So what difference the position makes, as you can see. So you see this x-ray and you might think that this patient has a massive pleural refusion if I told you that this patient was sitting up. But if you look at some associated features, the trachea is deviated towards the pleural refusion. Usually in the pleural refusion, if anything, the track should be pushed away because the pressure, it's pulled if it's a simple pneumothorax. An attention pneumothorax obviously is pushed away, but in a pleural fusion that shouldn't happen. And also here, you can see a surgical clip. This patient's had the lung removed for whatever reason. And as a result, because of the cavity, this has been pulled in and you can see the surgical clip there. And again, you say what you see, I see a wide area of the pacification. It's associated with a trachea deviated to the side of the lesion and a foreign body. 
mitochondrials are a pneumonectomy. However, it also could be a pleurofusion, for example. So say what you see. Next is fields and foreign bodies. Okay, this is probably the most important part. This essentially requires you to look at many, many, many x-rays and be able to tell what's normal and what's not of your way. There's no magic way for me to tell you how to spot things, except for a few particular diagnoses. But a lot of it is just looking at many x-rays that are bad and finding out um, patterns that you see, okay? Now, the way that I interpret them is you divide the lung into three zones. I know the right lung has three lobes and the left has two, but for all intents and purposes, make three equal zones. You comment on one, then one on the other side, and then you move down, then to the other side, okay? Just start by commenting on what you see. So divide into an upper lobe here. Start from the center, work your way out. I do this. Starting with the upper zone on the right-hand side, I can see lung markings throughout. These are these little areas of pacification, they're normal, okay? These, these are the pulmonary vessels, and these are little airways here, okay? You can see them throughout. And that helps you rule out the pneumothorax because in the pneumothorax, you get a collapse of the airways and just gas in the pleura. Okay? You comment on whether you can see any abnormal pacifications, which you can't hear. Okay? So I'd say that there's lung markings throughout. There's no abnormal pacifications or consolidations. Again, I'll tell you what that is very shortly. Okay? And there's no foreign bodies. Things to look out for obviously, lack of lung markings, which can mean pneumothorax and a pacification, which is a consolidation. A consolidation essentially is when the airway gets filled up with something denser than gas, like pus or fluid or infection or bacteria, essentially. And I'll show you some examples, but that's what a consolidation is, okay? And you comment on any foreign bodies, like NG tubes, ECG dots, lines, okay? Oxygen masks, you need blankets over them, is there hand over them, okay? Now, just to give you an example of what the difference is, an effusion is basically fluid that's collecting in the, in the pleura. Consolidation, as I told you, is when the airway gets filled up with something denser than air. Air is black and denser stuff is white. So you'll see like a white pacification, okay? This pacification is normal. This is dense because it's the main airways, it's the, um, it's the pulmonary vasculature so on and so forth, okay? And I'll show you some examples of consolidations. The collapse is essentially when the airway doesn't get filled, and as a result, all the airways deflate, okay? And I'll show you some pictures of a pneumothorax that's causing a collapse, okay? And it's hard to differentiate, so don't worry if you can't differentiate it. It's often very hard, and often you need to get a CT. So, this is an X-ray of a patient who has a pneumonia. The way that I would interpret this is that in the middle zone, there is an area of dense opacification, and you can see the horizontal fissure very well. You can only see the horizontal fissure if there's fluid in it, which shouldn't be there, okay? So there's fluid in the horizontal fissure, there's area of dense opacification, and then there's patchy opacification surrounding that. I think this is a consolidation. A lot of people will tell you a consolidation is something that's white on x ray. This is white. This is white, this is white. These are consolidations, are they? So this area of the pacifications can be patchy in nature, can also be dense, and often it's associated with the air bronchogram, which I'll show you what that is very shortly. Okay? Next X-ray. So this X-ray is a patient that I've seen recently that had um, coronavirus 19, COVID-19. You can see here, this patient has quite widespread changes, and I'll interpret this as that the patient has bilateral, widespread, patchy opacifications with some denser ones in the lower zone. This might be suggested of a consolidation, and these patchy changes might be suggested of pulmonary infiltrates or in, in because of an infection. And there's widespread air bronchograms as well. Now, an air bronchogram is essentially, remember, black is gas, so up here, for example, all these black dots surrounded by white, that's gas surrounded by something dense in the alveoli, such as an infection. When you have this many, that's not a normal appearance. Maybe you can see one or two here and then a normal x-ray. But when they're like this, 
or in a consolidation like here, that's a sign that a patient might have an infection, okay? And note that the fact that there's black there, meaning that there's gas coming through, which means that there isn't something affecting the main airway. Well, it doesn't rule it out, but it helps you work it out, okay? And the other things in this x-ray, central line here, NG tube here, ECGY here, and AT tube there, okay? So this is a good example of air bronchogram. You can see here, area of white opacifications with an air bronchogram. There's black here, which is gas, and white surround, and then white surrounding it. This white is all infection. This patient also has COVID. Okay, and you see in quite a few other places as well. And then this is another patient that has COVID as well. And I, I'd interpret this as widespread patchy opacifications consistent with the consolidation with air bronchograms and the pleural effusion on the left-hand side. It's also associated with an ET tube, central line, through his left internal jugular, okay? The patient actually has two central lines here, okay? Now for COVID, I haven't really read that much data to tell you what typical x-rays look like, but essentially for those who are joining the front line, if they have pneumonia, you need to mix it in with their clinical symptoms, fevers, cough, 20% of patients I've read recently that have coronavirus don't have actually any changes. Often it depends on the severity. If they tend to be quite well, I've found personally from my experience um, that they tend to have obviously quite some significant changes. But then again, I only work in hospital. I haven't seen a thousand cases. Um, so it'd be interesting to see what the literature comes out on um, when everything settles down, hopefully. Okay. And I'm sure when you start in hospitals, you'll be getting your own COVID talks. And we are hopefully planning in the next few weeks to find someone to give you a talk about COVID, okay, and the typical appearances. But these are some of the things that I've been seeing, okay? This is another patient that has coronavirus. Again, widespread patchy opacifications consistent with the consolidation. Why isn't it a collapse? Well, it's both sides. And again, you, you need to think about it clinically. When you look at the ECG, you need to think about the clinical picture. You know, is, is that ST elevation? Is that not what the patient hasn't got any symptoms? So um, how, how could it be? But this is obviously widespread. So you imagine that this patient um, has symptoms. So a pneumothorax. The way you can tell whether the pneumothorax is present is A, you can see the lining of the pleura and the lung very well inside the thoracic cavity, and beyond it, you can't see any lung markings. Remember, we see a few white markings here and there, which is a bit of the um, airways. Remember, having them is normal. When you see that black dot in extensive places, that can be an air bronchogram, essentially. That's a sign of pneumothorax, and that's because air is leaking from the lung outside of it and collapsing it down. And they can be quite painful. This is another example. This patient has pneumothorax on the right side. But if you were to look at this, if you were to do the C analysis and see that, oh, this patient has a, you know, some changes in the right border of the heart. It could be a pneumonia, it could be a collapse. But then you associate it with the lack of lung markings here. And then you say, oh, actually, this is a pneumothorax. And this is essentially the lung that has collapsed down because it's all shriveling up because of a lack of it's being compressed from the outside, it's, it's collapsed down. That's a confirmed collapse there. Now earlier I was telling you often the scapula can get in the way. Often people can see this and think, that's the lung margin there. Is it a pneumothorax? But often you need to track it back and see that's actually the scapula. Same on this side. People can be like, oh, there's a difference between here and here. Is that the lung margin? Is that a pneumothorax? But if you look very closely, you can see lung markings there. So look for lack of lung markings and look for the sign of the edge of the pleura. So pulmonary edema is one other thing that I think junior doctors should be able to um, at least be familiar with. And once they diagnose, at least be worried that this might be a sign. Um, so again, ATE approach. A is for alveolar bad rings. B is for carily B lines. C is for cardiomegaly. D for dilated pulmonary vessels and e fusions. I'll show you what some of these are. So pulmonary edema, these are alveolar backlinks. 
Imagine the center is the heart, and this here is the bat, wings essentially. That's a sign of pulmonary edema. You can see that it's quite hazy. That's quite typical of pulmonary edema. If it was solid, I'd think about something else. Okay? But this is pulmonary edema. There's no effusion though, but that's fine. You can get you can get a lack of effusions, but you can only get one sign. You don't have to have all signs to be diagnosed with pulmonary edema, in my experience. B lines are these lines here. These are short one, two centimeter parallel lines at the edge of the lung, the peripheral of the lung. And there are signs of interstitial edema. Okay, horizontal fissure, we obviously spoke about earlier. That's fluid in the horizontal fissure that isn't there normally or shouldn't be there normally, okay? Dilated vessels, that can be hard to interpret. I've seen some dilated vessels that I thought were normal, but later on they were reported as dilated. But you need to mix it in clinically, okay? Okay, we're on G now, the gastric bubble. This lumbar area, that's consistent with the stomach. Okay, that's a normal appearance. Some people say if someone's having chest pain and they see this, that makes them worry about whether the patient is actually having a bit of reflux. But seeing that does not rule out whether someone's having an MI or another cause of chest pain, and it does not rule in whether someone's having reflux, okay? It's a clinical correlation. Although some people, even I've seen that they have some reflux and they do an X-ray and they have gastric bubble. But I haven't done any obviously studies on it. I haven't seen any studies and I don't think it's a very sensitive sign. But it's worth commenting on. And obviously it can be obviously quite, um, it, you might wonder whether it's spirinium peritoneum. But then again, it's clinical context. Feel the abdomen. Is it tense? Is it tender? Um, is the lactate very high? Um, for example. And if you have any concerns, just ask a senior. So H is for Hyla, and in this I include the mediastinum as well. This is often very tricky to assess, uh, in my opinion, even I struggle with it sometimes. And the reason why you look for the hilum, the hilum is essentially a combination of structures um, of the main bronchi and the pulmonary vasculature um, and the lymph nodes inside as well. If it's it's important because if it's really prominent, that can be a sign of things like TB, cancer, lymphoma, immunological disorders. Where it, I've often seen x-rays that I thought had a really prominent hilum, they had a CT, it was normal, or the radiology reported the x-ray was normal. I've seen x-rays with normal hilum and then they've had CT, CTs and it's shown that they've had lymphoma or TB or cancers. So don't worry about interpreting the hilum too much. It's just worth recognizing. And um, other thing is the mediastinum, which is this whole structure here. People say that if it's big and wide, that's a sign of aortic dissection, or if it's big, it's a sign of a cancer within the mediastinum. I've read in a few places, if you measure from the aortic arch, which is here, the aortic knuckle essentially is the distal part of the aortic arch. If it's more than eight centimeters, that's a sign of a big mediastinum, which can be because of a cancer or aortic dissection. Remember, you need to think about it clinically. If you're worried about your dissection, they tend to be having chest pain, you know, tearing to the back, abnormal blood pressure, different in both arms, and you need a CT to diagnose that, okay? But it's just worth considering in your overall assessment. So this is apparently an extra of someone that has a prominent hilum, and it's quite dilated on both sides. Again, clinical diagnosis. Do they have any night sweats associated with it? Are they losing weight? any fevers, so on and so forth. So before we end, just a little bit about NG tube placement. Remember, this does not certify you to be able to say whether there are NG tubes in place. Follow your local hospital guidance, okay? A lot of places said that has to be done by radiologists. Other people says it has to be done by two junior doctors, one person, one hospital abuse, one junior doctor, one more senior doctor like a registrar. But essentially there's four points. This is the NG tube here. One, does it go down the middle through the esophagus and bias it in the carina? The carina comes before the bifurcation of the, of the trachea. So this is one bronchus, this is another bronchus. You can see that it's, it's bypassing that, okay? Does it cross and kink before the diaphragm, which it does? And can you see the tip below the diaphragm? If you have all four of those, you have to have all four for your level to be able, or for any level for that matter, to be able to say, 
whether it's in the right place. Often you do get x-rays with the tip well into um, the stomach and you can't see the tip. Um, but again, for all intents and purposes, run the biosenior because technically the criteria is that you have to have all four. Okay, and that's how you tell whether the entry tube's in place. Do not take any risks. If you are at all concerned that it's not in the right place, get a senior to have a look. Not a fellow F1, okay, remember the same grade as you, another senior. Feeding an NG tube into the lungs is a catastrophic event, and it's a never event, okay? It's like giving someone 1,000 units of insulin or um, getting an x-ray on a patient that has a tension pneumothorax, okay? And one caveat to the, this is that it has to be a good quality x-ray, not a goof quality. I do apologize for that. The x-ray has to be good quality. If it's poor quality x-ray, do not rely on that. Ask them to repeat it, okay? And any concerns, ask your seniors. So a few tips before we finish. At the end of your summary, your ATM assessment or whatever assessment you do, remember you don't have to follow that particular order. I did A, B to I, B signing for bones. Often you want to do breathing before that because obviously it might be more important for the bones at that time. It's just the way that I remember it. Find a way that works for you is make sure it's systematic in nature. At the end of your report, always summarize it. So in summary, this is an X-ray of a 50-year-old Mr. X. Um, he has, for example, a widespread area of pacification on uh, his left and right lung associated with pleurofusions. My di differentials are infection, heart failure, whatever. Always have all the x-rays, or at least ask for all the x-rays to compare them to, okay? That's paramount to look for any new changes. Um, this is more for when you start working in the hospitals, but be familiar with your PAC system. PAC is essentially the, um, the national um, for, um, computer program that we use to assess um, x-rays or to upload x-rays um, on, onto computers. On it, you can do things like you can magnify into particular areas and you can do an invert function, which essentially, um, instead of white being white, it turns to black essentially, like in this x-ray, you can see that the lung is now white when it's normally black. There's not a lot of evidence to say that this actually works, uh, but sometimes I've seen that when you do that, you can see a pneumothorax a little bit better, like in this case. You can't really see it here that well, but in this case you can. So again, that's not, that's not a hard and fast thing that you have to do. And there's not a lot of evidence saying that it works, but rarely it can. So it doesn't take a long time. Also, stand back from your x-ray. Stand in front of it as well, close up to get a good view. But it's often good to stand a bit further away to have a look. And for me now, when I'm standing back looking at this x-ray, I can see his pneumothorax a bit easier. And once you've done with your report and the exam, offer additional tests. For example, if you think someone has heart failure, or if you see they have cardiomegaly with a bit of infusion, you'd, be, you'd probably say, I like to get an echo and um, cardiac studies. Um, or if you see that they have a pneumonia, you'd be like, I'd want to get an APG or a CRP or blood tests. Um, okay, so that concludes our lecture. Um, if you have any questions, you can message on the Facebook group for Digital Doctors. And I really hope you enjoyed this lecture very much. And one last thing before we finish, this is mainly directed at the people here that wanted to do emergency medicine, acute medicine or intensive care. This is an ultrasound that I took. This is the diaphragm here. This is a quite a large pleurofusion. This patient had a normal x-ray. My point is ultrasounds are more sensitive for a lot of lung pathologies, especially things like pneumothoraxes and pleurofusions in the right hands, obviously, uh, compared to an x-ray, especially if the x-ray is not for quality. Of course, you still, it, this doesn't obviously mean that you can't, you shouldn't get an x-ray, you always get an x-ray, but bedside ultrasound is becoming an increasingly useful skill to get an answer straight away. So those of you who are looking to go into emergency medicine, acute medicine, or ITU, go on an ultrasound course, start the logbook, get signed off, and it makes your life a lot easier. Thank you very much.